let's continue to talk about our hardware components that we need to connect through our ports to our motherboard which are contained within the system unit. These include secondary storage and inputs and outputs. Now first of all, we need to realize when we talk about secondary storage that these are usually environments that allows us to save information, larger amounts of information, on a more permanent basis. For example, if you have an external hard disk or USB memory sticks, you can save your information and you can transfer it to another device and it allows you to take relatively large amounts of information from one computer to another. We do find that these offer us various advantages. For example, these are non-volatile, so it's not going to delete your information except if you do so. They provide you with a greater capacity, more storage capabilities, and it's also going to be cheaper if we compare it, let's say for argument's sake, to primary storage, which, which would be your RAM and your ROM. The disadvantage is it is going to be slightly slower due to the electromechanical processes. So what we typically find is this is an example of a hard disk. It contains multiple platters. These platters will write this read-write head will write the information on these platters that spins continuously. Remember, we said ones and zeros. And it's actually going to take a row and it's going to magnetize various areas along this row in order to represent those ones and zeros. And that is pretty much how your information will be saved. Now, when information is saved, it can either take place through one of two axis methods. It can be through sequential axis or it can be through direct axis. Now what is sequential axis? That is a retrieval method in which data must be collected in the order in which it is stored. So if you look at the picture here, imagine a small notepad. All of the information that you write on the, on the notepad will be one after another. So you go through the whole list in order to get your information. So one record will be saved after another record. So for argument's sake, if you come back later on and you want to only look at this, you need to start at the beginning and you need to jump from one record to another until you reach what you're looking for. Sequential access will typically be saved on sequential access storage devices. And these are usually in the form of our old magnetic tapes. So you start your tape, you write your data to the tape and you access it in that manner. You guys might think back to your old music tapes. So if you wanted to listen to a song, you had to listen from the beginning or the end. Or if you wanted to proceed um, further down the tracks, you needed to fast forward or return to previous locations. On the other side, we have direct access. Now with this retrieval method, Data can be retrieved without the need to go and read all the information before it. So typically what we would find is all your information would be saved on the hard disk wherever space is available. So if you look at this, this is in a sequential order. In this case, it's in a random order. So it actually goes, it saves information wherever it finds space. So if you want to find specific information, let's say for argument's sake, again, record number eight, it can immediately jump to record number eight, not worrying about the seven records before that. Devices that use this are known as direct access storage devices. And these are typically your hard disks that we nowadays do find. Now let's go and look at some other storage devices. Perhaps lesser known are magnetic tapes now this would allow you to sequentially save information on this particular medium. Again, you've got a, a tape or band that will be rolled up on a spool and information will be saved along this tape. And if you need to record it, it should actually go and record that sequentially from the beginning till the end. Similar to our audio and video, video cassettes, cassettes that we had in the past, sorry. And as I've indicated, similar to your hard disk, certain sections will be magnetized, which would represent either a one or a zero, coming back to our bits. 
These are slower, but they were cheaper, and these were mainly used for backups. So we might find in large organizations that they still make use of these types of magnetic tapes. And this is purely if they just want to go and make backups for in case they need to recall it at a later stage. The next type of disk that we started to refer to, a direct access storage device, which would allow you to go and immediately retrieve your information. And this is typically in the form of your hard disks. And these would include rotating disks that was magnetized and that you could also go and through changing the, the area on that disk to ones and zeros, either magnetized or not magnetized, to represent your information. It's usually coated with iron, iron oxide. It contains thin metallic platters, which are these cylindric cylindrical disks. And as I've indicated, we would go and write small magnetized areas on top of these platters. The next set of devices we find are known as RAID devices. Now the full name, the redundant array of independent, inexpensive disks. Now this is a method that you that allows you to store information and where it actually goes and saves it on multiple disks. So for, so for example, if you look at this unit, we have two, four, six, eight disks. So it can save information on any one of these disks or across multiple disks. And it will actually go and save the information in such a way that if one of the drives fail, that it can go and rebuild all the lost data. So if something happens to your device, you're not going to lose all your information. So the data would be split across multiple drives. We would find a concept known as mirroring. Now with mirroring, it actually goes and it saves sections of that data on multiple drives. So in case something happens to one drive, we can locate it on other drives and get back our original data. So it would typically duplicate certain parts of your data. We need to realize that this is a good example of why we need this, because there's always a risk that we would lose data, and there's always a, a risk that, they, that devices might break down. So this allows us to have fault tolerance within our operating environments. The next device that we're going to look at is known as a virtual tape. Now, if you think back to the tape that we talked about, we said it was a sequential access storage device, meaning everything is saved one after another and you have to read through all of this. Now, with virtual tapes, it simulates that whole tape environment, but it also brings in your faster hard disks. So what's going to seem to be a tape drive will actually be hard disks. So whenever you need to recall less used information it actually goes and retrieve it from a hard disk so why do we have this typically in environments where we got less frequently needed data it appears to be saved on tapes but it's actually on faster hard disks it also uses a virtual tape server so there's a storage management component and then it's going to be slower but less costly and it's also going to reduce your floor space that you need Typically, we would find that the infrastructure required for your hard disks are much smaller than the infrastructure that we would have for our magnetized tapes. Another type of system that we find, especially in larger companies, are known as a storage area network. Now, these are high-speed special purpose networks that integrate various types of storage devices into a single system. So in your company, they might, they might use various systems. They can use your old traditional ways of saving information. For example, if you look at this, stiffy drives, CD drives, cassette tapes, it might be information saved on different computers. So all of that information would be linked into a SAN storage area network. And if people want to access that information, they access it through whatever method allows them to gain access to it. Now we find that these use high speed communication channels. So the channel in between these various devices will be quite quick. And nowadays we typically find this as fiber optic channels, which we'll discuss in a future chapter. So when you send information from one device to another device, it's going to be 
extremely fast. Um, SAN networks can actually provide you with very important capabilities such as disk mirroring that we've discussed, data backups, restoring data that you need to get back, archiving data, migrating data from one device to another, as well as sharing data between various devices across the network. Now let's go and look at some of the perhaps better known devices that we do see or mediums that we do see. The first one we're going to talk about is optical discs. Now an optical disc, a CD-ROM, usually allows you to save about 740 megabytes or 80 minutes of audio. So in today's data requirement terms, these are actually relatively small. It's known as a compact disc. Um, compact disc read only memory. So that's why we call it a CD-ROM. And usually what we do find is that once you've written information on it, you can't go and overwrite it. So it's burned onto that particular medium. And that's why they're talking about you need to go and burn a CD. So instead of magnetizing areas, you will have a laser light that would make small burned imprints on that medium, representing again the ones and zeros. So the disk becomes read only. Once your information is written to it, you can't go and make adjustments or delete it. So it remains fixed. You will have a CD burner in order to record the data. So typically you would find with older computers that you had a CD-ROM drive. So you had a drive that could only read it. But then you also had newer drives that would allow you to go and burn your own CDs. Now when you buy these CD-ROMs, you would typically see that you get it in various formats. You might get it as CD-R or CD-RW. CD-R is a compact disc recordable which would allow you to go and only once write to that particular disk. Then you get the rewritable disks, which would allow you to rewrite information on that disk for a certain number of times. Again, um, because it's burning information on the disk, it will have certain limitations and you can't use it um, unlimited times. The next type of disc that we're going to refer to is known as your DVDs, your digital video discs. And the capabilities of these are quite larger than your CD-ROMs. For example, we would find that with a CD-ROM, we could have saved about 740 megabytes. Now we can save 4.7 gigabytes or 135 minutes compared to 80 minutes previously. So these present you with better capabilities they are also more expensive you do get them in various sizes for example people would tend to talk about a single sided dvd which would allow you to say 4.7 gigabytes of information or you might find a double sided one which would save information on the front side as well as the back side which would give you roughly 9.4 gigabytes you would also find that you get it in various formats. So you get DVD minus R, DVD plus R. And uh, the difference between the plus and minus R comes down to the way in which the laser beam will actually record the information on these disks. So again, it's only going to do it once and thereafter you can't change that information. On the other side, we do get DVD minus RW, DVD plus RW and then DVD minus RAM. So these are rewritable environments. If you think back to the CD-ROM that we discussed, it's going to allow you to write information, to modify it, and perhaps to delete information on that particular um, medium. We do find Blu-ray high definition video discs. Now Blu-ray uses blue laser technology, which is a more specialized laser beam and this one can allow you to save up to 25 gigabit, gigabytes worth of data. There is a new standard that they're currently working on, which should be released shortly, known as HVD, which also stands for Holographic Versatile Disks. And this environment allows you to save, to save information up to one terabyte and more. So what's going to happen in this environment, it will create, if you think about a hologram, 
you will have various layers of light so your information can be saved at various depths on these particular disks allowing you to actually save more information the next type of storage device known as a solid state storage devices SSDs and this is typically what we know as our USB flash drives or our memory sticks so with the SSD instead of having something physically with platters and read write heads that need to access information your information will be saved on chips now if you compare this to hard disks you would find that space wise um, USB are actually more expensive than your old external hard disks or portable hard disks on the upside these devices require less power so you just take it you plug it into your USB port and it works um, for some of the other type of devices your hard disks you might need to have an extra power supply or an extra USB cable to plug it in in order to power up that device it provides you faster data access because we don't have those components that need to move around in order to access your data it can just go in immediately through um, direct access locate your information there's fewer moving parts it's less fragile the disadvantage as I've said we've got a high cost and lower capacity we do find these as external USB flash drives it's removable and it's rewritable the disadvantage again as I've mentioned higher cost lower cap capacity the next storage um, concept that we need to talk about is storage as a service or also known as SAAS now this is a data storage model where your storage will be handled by a service provider which will rent space out to individuals and organizations so if you guys look at the icons at the bottom this is what we know as cloud services for example Dropbox, Google Drive, SkyDrive etc so you will go and create an account with them and they would allow you to go and save the information on their computing devices so people would typically access the rented storage space over the internet um, companies can opt to pay per usage service so they only pay for what they actually use and need or they go, can go and pay a fixed amount in order just to have a, let's have arguments like a terabyte worth of space available services are hosted at the service provider um, however companies can request situations where they want those services on their own premises but it will still be handled by a service provider it's sensible to use this if your company experience fluctuating storage needs and it's also nice where you need when you need to access your information from any, anywhere around the world from various devices so if you guys think about it um, I think the popularity of these things are that with Google Drive and let's say Gmail those kind of things it didn't limit you to various or fixed computers in a company or in a house but it do allow you to use various devices in order to gain access to your information let's go on and talk about storage or oh sorry input devices now when we talk about input devices we do find various types available we get our personal computer in input devices and these typically include your keyboards and your mouse allowing you to enter text or to have movement on screen we also find that most of these nowadays are wireless or either connected and that they go and they ergonomically design this based upon people's hands and the way that it feels and making it more comfortable to touch the buttons all those kind of things we also find touchpads on a laptop we typically find this so you've got a touchpad and when you move your finger across it it simulates the mouse movement on screen and then there are some video clips that I'm going to add at the end of this particular video showing you guys what what new de developments and technologies we're actually going to experience then we have speech recognition technology 
and these include technology that allows you the computer to recognize speech and once recognized it's they will actually go and execute those commands and again um, on the older systems we had to train them but with newer technologies such as Siri Google Now Cortana that we find on Windows Bixby voice on the new Samsung phones that allows you to speak to the device the device recognizes what you say and they go and execute those commands then we have motion sensing devices these are typically used by major game makers where it detects human movement and then based upon the movement it actually goes and it executes instructions now this is something very nice that we can use in environments where we can't really go and let's say for argument's sake touch screens so by just swiping you would find that it executes those instructions other input devices digital cameras which allows you to actually go and record and store images and videos in a more digital format and it actually also adds some extra capabilities that we didn't traditionally find with older cameras other input devices we find scanning devices now the purpose of something like a scanner is to capture an image and character data um, similar to a copy machine so it, it can either be stationary or handheld so you would take a photograph or a paper you would put it in the scanner it's going to scan it and it's going to save that printed output in an electronic format now our companies are using these more and more to allow themselves to go and record all these printed documents also known as legacy documents and to save that at various locations now the problem with printed documents is it's going to take up a lot of space there's always a risk that it can um, get damaged, it gets lost, and it's very difficult to go and make backups. So the electronic version is actually much better. The next input device that we have, optical data readers. Now we typically find two categories, OMR, optical mark recognition, and also optical character recognition, OCR. Now optical mark recognition um, you guys or people generally use it in MCQ forms so you've got a form with a bunch of dots you answer your question paper on that form by circling the dots that is sent into a machine the machine recognizes the placement of the dots and if it is at the correct space it's going to tick it as a mark otherwise it's going to see it as a, a wrong mark on the other side we've got optical character recognition and with OCR it's going to use reflective light to recognize documents so let's say for argument's sake you've got a printed document you scan it into the scanner and through OCR it would recognize the characters and it would send it to let's say your word processing application eliminating the need for you to go and type that document over in electronic format the next input device that we have magnetic ink character recognition now these we find um, less frequently typically um, in the older days when we had the printed checkbooks the account number at the bottom in the checkbook that was usually printed with magnetized ink and whenever they sent that check through a device it could pick up the information contained within that magnetized ink and it could have retrieved that information the next set of input devices magnetic cards so these I don't think we need to go into detail that much so typically you would find that you had a bank card um, we find these in student cards etc so there might be a mag magnetized strip data will be embedded on that strip again as ones and zeros and when you take that card and you swipe it through a machine it's going to recognize and read the information and it's going to make it available we do get smart cards smart cards contains a embedded chip and on that chip there's more information now typically these cards will be inserted into a device there might be a pin contained on the chip 
and it's going to ask you to enter the PIN before, let's say, a transaction can take place. Some of the newer developments, we do find contactless payment cards. Um, you guys might have heard about Tap and Go. I think Standard Bank was one of the companies offering this, where again, there's an embedded chip inside the card. So if you want to make your payment, you just take your credit card, you tap it on a device, RFID enabled device. It's going to read the information embedded on that chip and it's going to execute that transaction. Now, just for interest sake, these types of cards allow for much faster transaction taking to take place. So if you think about a banking system, you would be able to help more customers by using these type of cards. Then we also find point of sale devices. Now these are usually terminals that we find in shops and the terminal will capture information. So people will bring their products. They're going to scan the barcodes on those products and then the data would be recorded in that system. So more frequently used in retail environments and the system will keep track of the number of products scanned it's going to accumulate the totals, it's going to add tax, and then it's going to issue receipts. What we also find is that nowadays, that people are starting to use smartphones and tablets as point of sale devices. So you've got a device that you can put into your phone and that would allow you to conduct your transactions, your business transactions. We also find barcode scanners. So you would have a handheld scanner you would point it at a barcode, it's going to scan the barcode, convert it to information and then it's going to recognize the information and you can go and start using that information. Another example that we typically find on our mobile phones are QR codes. Now here we find an example of a QR code. So your phone through the camera, you would take a picture of that QR code, it's going to recognize what's embedded in that code and it's either going to link you up to a website or a link or other content or information embedded or linked up to that particular code. The next set of input devices that we find are RFID devices. Now it's also known as re radio frequency identification. So typically we find these on um, student cards, we might find it on key rings where you need to get access to a building. So inside of the card, there's a microchip that's embedded in, into it with an antenna. And you actually take that card, you bring it close to a proximity reader. The reader will read the information and if access should be granted, it's going to allow access. Um, in most cases, you need to be relatively close to the reader in order to read the information with some of the nicest systems you do find that it contains what is known as EEPROM chips now EEPROM stands for erasable programmable read-only memory which would allow you to write information back to that chip so in some of the larger companies let's say for argument's sake they've got these RFID stickers or labels attached to products so as soon as that product is scanned that it's being sold, it's going to change a number on inventory and when it leaves the shop, it indicates that that product has been taken out. So it just allows you to have more track of these types of environments. We do find this in especially large manufacturing environments. So let's say for argument's sake, you've got a clothing store and you're ordering a thousand products. So in the older days, you had to go and physically count the products when they were delivered by the suppliers. If the products contain these RFID chips, as soon as the lorry drives into your premises, the proximity reader can automatically count the amount of products in the, in the load and immediately you've got access to that information. So it makes our lives actually a lot easier. The next input device that we have is known as pin input devices. Again, we do see some examples of these on certain smartphones. For example, the LG Stylus phone as well as the Samsung Galaxy Note. So you've got something that represents a pin which would allow you to actually go and write on the screen of that particular device. 
so it's going to allow you to write text draw images etc and again it's going to convert that to information we find touch sensitive screens that can also be categorized as an input device so on touch screens it allows you to go and touch on the screen and wherever you touch it recognizes the placement of your finger and that will be would be seen as location of for example a pointer or pointing um, device certain parts would be sensitive so whenever you click on that it's going to trigger commands and it allows you to save space and it increases portability for example if you look at the screen that we have here usually we see this in the form of tablets so in all the traditional systems you you would have needed to have a keyboard and a mouse so now by having a touch screen you're replacing those because your screen becomes your keyboard and your finger movement on the screen also becomes your mouse movement the last input device that we typically find are known as your brain um, brain scanning devices um, brain computing interfaces it, the other name for it is actually bci and this is what it actually looks like it's a it's a device that you will place on your head and as you're thinking of executing commands it recognizes your brain signals and those signals will be transferred into commands and those will be executed another example of input device on our cell phones we find that nowadays all our cell phones has gyroscopic capabilities so as you're moving your cell phone it knows in which direction you're moving it if you're tilting it all those aspects so a huge list of input devices now let's continue and go and look at some of the output devices now for output devices we typically find that we said in the first section that we explained when we talked about the system components that the output of one system might become the input of another system so it's important to remember that so whatever you put in your input you type something on a keyboard that is reflected on a computer screen in an application and that now becomes an output so one of the more regularly known ones are perhaps your display monitors so you've got a computer screen and that computer screen allows you to go and see whatever content is available where it, whether it be text images etc now just for interest sake we do find different types of screens lcd screens liquid crystal display led your light emitting diode screens oled organic light emitting diode and then also plasma screens and in the older days with the old tv screens those very bulky ones those were known as crt um, cathode ray tube screens now if you look at these and we're not going to go into detail with them it all comes down to the quality of that screen the type of chemicals that will be used within the screen and how light will be emitted from those screens so what we do find is that um, especially your LEDs and your OLED screens these are giving you better quality images they're using less power and they are generally your your better screens that you can actually go and buy um, again the bigger your screen the more it's going to cost you now why are we concerned about the size of a screen now it all comes down to pixels you guys would see that whenever you go and look at computer screens or TV screens they would talk about aspects such as it's HD ready or it's full HD nowadays they talk about ultra HD 4k 8k etc now this comes down to the amount of information that can be displayed across the screen now that information will be represented as pixels now a pixel can be defined as a dot of color so on the older TVs when you went and sit very closely in front of the TV you could have recognized three colors red sorry red green and blue and the combination of colors that are displayed will actually represent the image on screen 
So it's going to change the values for red, green, and blue, and that would represent other, other color values, ultimately indicating different colors that you would be able to recognize. Now, as I've said, the quantity of a screen is determined by the number of vertical and horizontal pixels. So for argument's sake, if we talk about full HD, the measurement would go from that corner to that corner. So they would tell you it's, let's say, 47 inches. And full HD screens typically has 1,024 um, pixels. So that determines the amount of information that's displayed. So the more information, the better quality the screen and the better quality the images that's displayed. Some other output devices that we do find, we get plotters and printers. Now these allow us to have paper-based outputs. Now again we find them in different speeds with various features and capabilities. If we talk about printers, the speed are usually measured by the amount of pages printed per minute and again it could um, differentiate between colored pages versus black and white pages. So if you go and buy a printer, usually on the box they will tell you that this printer can print, let's say for argument's sake, 16 black and white pages per minute or 8 colored pages per minute. So it depends on the speed of the printer and what type of technology it's, it's going to use. The quality or the resolution depends again on the number of dots per inch and it's also known as DPI. So again, your higher range printers will have a better DPI ratio, meaning they're going to have more quality printouts that would be delivered. We do find laser printers which uses different types of printing techniques. So for argument's sake, on, in the older days, <coughs> We had dot matrix printers, which resulted in your printer having an ink embedded lint. And there was a device that would press against the lint and that lint would transfer it to a page. So it was very bad quality printouts that you got. That was replaced by bubble jet printers. Now with bubble jet printers, it would actually take the ink and splatter the ink on the page, okay, remember very smallly and finely, and that would again represent your images. And nowadays we do find laser printers where the ink is actually burned onto the page or the, the, the powder is burned onto the page. Some of the newer technologies that we're seeing more and more, 3D printing, for example, if you look at the image here, this is 3D printing. So you would have a th three-dimensional image on a computer and then that printer will actually go and print that image for you. Again, I'm going to show you various videos that will explain to you some of the, the new concepts that we do find. The last device for, or the last one on this screen that we need to refer to, plotters. Plotters we typically find in architect firms or firms where they do branding and marketing where you've got a large piece of paper and that paper passes and you've got various pens, um, various colors for these pens and they actually go and draw on that paper in order to represent the artwork or the design. Some other output devices that we find, ebooks. Now again, I don't think ebooks are that popular. Um, these were mainly replaced by tablets because there's more functionality built into tablets. But the, the idea behind it was that instead of having a printed book, you can take all your books and you can have it in electronic format. And then it's easier to carry. You can make backups. You can go and download new books. And generally speaking, it just makes your life a lot easier. It also allowed you to have it in various screen sizes and to go and change the size of text if you want for argument's sake larger or smaller text. The next output device, um, I think most people know this, um, digital audio players or perhaps your, even your cell phones where you've got music um, installed or saved on the device and it allows you to actually go and play music from that particular device. Examples would include your iPod, iPod Touch as well as various cell phones. 
other output devices that we typically find speakers haptic feedback now just for interest sake haptic feedback for example if you think about your cell phone the vibrating action that you have so whenever you press a button that small vibration that you feel that could be considered to be haptic feedback okay please try to think of some other devices there are some other ones available which we will cover in later discussions as well